Good day. I'm Yan Yan from Nan University. I'm here to present an a typical paper as noted by one of my reviewers about some thoughts on teaching operating systems. Our paper addresses an interesting problem. That is, can we find any better way to teach operating systems? Given that some of my students may have a chance to go on to become top-notch system researchers, this is not yet being done completely well. Even though we already have really great textbooks we loved, like the OSDI book I used when I was learning operating systems, and the OSDAP book I use now as a teacher, but、um, it seems we're still having some distance from hitting the mark. At least I found students, even those who already learned the textbooks, still have hard times in reading OSDI papers. And this talk provides some reflections on what is missing in our operating system class. So let's kick off by defining what is an operating system. There is a body of software responsible for making it easy to run programs. That's our operating system. But the big problem here is that students don't really understand what is a program. To back up this claim, I'd like to have a little mind-twisting program assignment for all of you: the Tower of Hanoi. I'm expecting most of you encountered this example in your introductory programming language course. And had a hard time wrap your mind around the magic of recursion, with its three mystical recursion function calls. To be a little bit more challenging, I'm asking to provide a non-recursive stack emulation, and I guess that 95% of Google interviewees wouldn't be able to get it correct on a blackboard. But we already know that a program has a stack for storing local variables, right? Every student knows that fact. So, why does stack emulation seem so tricky? Are we missing something? If you really think harder about this, you will realize that there is something else that should be in the stack. It's the program counter. The tricky part is that each stack frame has its own program counter. The stack itself is the runtime state of the program, and each single step of execution executes the statement on the program counter from the topmost stack frame. At this point, the meaning of function calls and returns became obvious. Following this idea that this program is a state machine, we get a beautiful non-recursive solution to the power of Hanoi, which is surprisingly similar to the recursive one by providing a neat definition of what are function calls and returns. And yes, I guess I have gone a little bit too far into programming languages. Let's back to the main topic of this talk. We're talking about state machines. Programs are state machines. Operating systems are built to host these programs, and therefore, state machines can be the missing abstraction in operating system classes. So, this paper's major point is that everything in an operating system class is actually a state machine. This argument certainly holds for computer hardware, right? Digital circuits are state transition systems. Registers, DRAMs, and storage systems are all arrays of bits. Think of digital circuits as systems that transition from one state to another, in which the processor fetches one instruction at a time to shift from one state to the next. It's an obvious that anything running on a computer is also a state machine. And operating systems are containers of programs or state machines, right? These programs. On the processor, either progress by executing a user-level instruction, or they trap into the operating system, which, by the way, is also a state machine through interrupts and system calls. Up until now, everything seems pretty straightforward, right? It might seem like I've been wasting your time rehashing things you have already known well since your undergraduate days. Why even bother with state machines? Because state machines are mathematically rigorous objects. Being defined as a five-tuple consisting of states, an alphabet, initial and final states, and a transition function. Well, we're talking about operating systems, so no more such complex definitions. On the other hand, we emphasize that such a definition does exist, and everything in the computer system should be treated with the same precision as a mathematical object. This gives some refreshing ideas in how to teach operating systems. So let's look at process APIs from the perspective of a state machine. 
the fork system call takes a photocopy of a state machine, with every bit in the address space being copied, and every bit in the register file being copied. The exit system call is like a delete button. It completely removes the state machine from the operating system. And the exe CVE system call is like a reset button. It brings the state machine back to a specific starting point defined by an executable file, with every byte in the memory being precisely defined. So where to find the value of every byte in the address space? This becomes a good question for students. Driven by this question, students will go for debuggers, documentations, all sources of information, and eventually explore more complex system specifications, like the System 5 application binary interface. So interesting, right? It's like we have built a bridge between the clean theory and the dirty practice by introducing state machines. Take this a step further. Let's see something real that students may face in hacking real operating systems and see how the idea of everything is a state machine can guide them. Yes, we write bugs every day. In the first case, we have a deployed system of approximately 100 machines of identical software and hardware, but one of them has a 100% of CPU usage. The second case, which is a bit different, is I'm trying to install a Linux distribution via USB. The kernel boots up just fine, but it complains not able to find a medium containing a live file system. This is so odd because the kernel itself is in the medium. Bad enough, Stack Overflow posts and GPTC answers didn't help solving this problem. While debugging these issues seem not a big problem for us, they tend to give students a hard time. This is where state machines come to help. We teach the students that the essence of debugging is understanding the state machine trace. And there is even an OSDI paper on this very topic last year. In terms of debugging, we have debuggers that travel back and forth in time and examine a program's runtime state. In this sense, any program can be debugged including the case of installation script. And we introduce that case in our class. We also have sanitizers that check the state machine trace against errors. Address sanitizer, thread sanitizer, and lock depth are covered in our course. They're really important in improving the quality of large scale systems like an operating system kernel. We have profilers that periodically collect state samples to aid in diagnosing performance issue. The kernel's profiler helped me debugging the high CPU usage case. An XHCI-related function was consuming too much time, which pointed to a hardware bug, like the first bug in computer, due to a short circuit USB port. An even more non-trivial example in our class is that a compiler significantly impacts the system's behavior. For the program that concurrently increments the RACI counter, we get quite different results on different levels of compiler optimization. This is also an interesting case. What's the problem? To understand why this is happening and to understand the exact type of compiler optimizations that are permitted, let's revisit the state machine model. A compiler essentially translates a high-level state machine like C programs to a low-level state machine in assembly. Both these high-level and low-level state machines have something in common. They both call out to the external world, like making a system call. And here is the point. The compiler must preserve the sequence of system calls during optimization. This is exactly what we mean when we talk about a correct compiler translation. And it's the key idea behind the development of formally verified compilers for mission-critical systems. Yes, we're talking about some serious non-trivial research systems in an undergraduate level operating system course. Even if we can't get involved in the full details of the system, the state machine model still provided good motivations of this research. So I guess I have convinced you a bit that state machines are useful in teaching operating systems. We have other examples like state transitions don't always have to trap to the kernel. We can actually have system calls that don't require traps, thereby avoiding contest switching. If our class has only one takeaway message to the students, it will be, when you are in trouble, don't panic. Compare systems are simply state machines. So just do what you need to do to understand them. And this is not the end of our story. 
since state machines are mathematically rigorous objects, why not write a program to emulate them, right? Then we can see state machines run lively on our computers. Yes, we did. Actually, we did more than that. Given that everything is a state machine, we can emulate anything. Our operating system course at Nanjing University has a pre-required course in which students build a full system emulator of RISA 5. And for those who make it to the end, their emulators can boot Linux without any modification. This is a real deal for undergraduates. In our operating system course, we emulate an operating system to clarify concepts in a mathematically rigorous way. So let's first see how to build a toy emulator in 50 lines of code. We have a Python user level programs that starts with a main function, which can perform system calls, like the very first user level program in Unix that created everything else in the operating system world. The system call trap is implemented by yield, which turns the main function into a generator, into a coroutine. Upon yield, the Python runtime automatically saves the program state in a closure-like object. This essentially emulates a program trapping into a real operating system kernel in which registers are saved into the kernel private memory. And the operating system proceeds with trap handling with the application being passed until a coroutine send is performed. Then we got ourselves an operating system model that can run multi-threaded programs. If we put in just a little bit more effort into the implementation, we got a reasonably small yet usable model for an operating system course. We have modeled nine system calls that cover processes, threads, and storages, or the three easy pieces. The implementation of fork is a bit tricky because Python doesn't allow us to deep copy a generator object. So what we actually do is a full system replay to create a duplication of the entire operating system. You can find more details in the paper and the source code. The model can help us explain interesting textbook cases, like this one, a final exam problem, and interesting things is going to happen. Let's make them in a terminal. We do a lot of this kind of code demonstration in classes. First, we can try running this program. And we get one, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. But we really have Unix philosophy that suggests us another program can help us do this job. And we can pipe the outputs to another command. So let's do this. We can pipe it to a word count command and get in result of Eight, hey, they produce inconsistent results. You may already notice that this is due to the buffer mechanism in the C standard library, which can be controlled by set buff. Yes, we can model this behavior, make it clear, observe its execution without debugging into the standard library. We also model condition variables by the system calls to make every detail explicit in teaching concurrency. There's a particular detail that students often miss. A thread must reacquire the mutex lock once it's been awakened. This model also explains the semantics of wait and broadcast. In conclusion, we use executable models to deliver a message that a thorough and rigorous understanding of a system can be achieved through the state machines. Well, building an emulator is still not the end of the story. We played a little trick in the implementation of MOSEC. That is, we don't execute system calls directly. Instead, every system call in our implementation returns a set of possible choices in the form of callbacks. It means that for each state, we can get its all possible subsequent transitions, thereby allowing us to generate a complete state transition graph. Yes, we get a model checker, which exhaustively enumerates all reachable states nearly for free. The model checker serializes the state transition graph into a JSON object, and then we encourage the students to follow the Unix philosophy to pipe the plain text graph to different backends. For example, they could use a quick and dirty graph to get all possible program outputs. And I'm always doing this in class demonstrations. 
or students could use an interactive state explorer to see what's happening inside the model. This is all because state machine is a mathematical object and we can emulate them. Model checkers have long been using verifying concurrent programs, but we did a little bit more than that by simulating a disk that non-deterministically persists outstanding block device threats. Then we can exhaustively check possible crash sites for file system consistency. The model checker verified that the informal arguments presented in the OSTEP textbook is indeed correct and exhaustive. And our final example explained in our class is the CLI paper, which we really loved about symbolic verification. It's great to see more and more operating system papers in recent years use the symbolic execution to verify or analyze real systems. But the first problem would be, what is symbolic execution, right? This is something not mentioned in an operating system textbook. But we can motivate it by observing how our naive model checker blows on checking even toy programs, which computes the sum of two 32-bit integers. In this case, we have the two to the 64 states in the second layer of the state transition graph, and then nobody could ever afford that. But the vertices in the same layer really look similar, which gives us opportunity to improve our model checker. By merging states into one single node and create a symbolic variable to denote x and y that can be any value. If we can have an emulator for error VM bitcode on this lazy representation of states, we end up with a symbolic verifier that can check programs against the properties. And enumeration, perhaps, is a fundamental approach to help us thoroughly understand computer systems. This course received positive feedbacks from students, and we talked a lot about state machines as you can see on the blackboard. We added a lot more interesting cases into this course beyond model and checker, including a game cheater that hacks real games and made all course materials public and open source. This is one of the most popular and best rated operating system course in mainland China with over 2 million video plays. And I guess this is why my visa is still under administrative processing. So this is the end of the story. We have a model, a checker, and more importantly, a fresh perspective in teaching operating systems, which empowered us to think more rigorously, automate our checks, and to deliver exciting ideas to the up and coming generation of system researchers. Really wished I could be here in person to answer your questions, but anyway, feel free to shoot me an email anytime. Thanks.